Jackson County is funded through revenues from federal forests, that is from the ONC lands, the old Oregon and California Railroad lands. Uh, the ONC Act actually was written in 1937. And from that time forward, those which used to be private lands were now public lands. They were put into the BLM and were to be managed uh, for the production of timber and for the benefit of the 18 ONC counties. In 1937, when these lands were, uh, when they were writing the act and when they were switching them from private lands to BLM lands, federal lands, we know that there were 40 billion board feet of timber, standing timber, on those lands at that time. Fifty years later, in 1987, they had cut 40 billion board feet. And they cruised it, they found out they still had 50 billion board feet of standing timber. So it was done in a sustainable way, it benefited all the counties, and of course it benefited the rural communities throughout Oregon. So over the years it worked pretty well and until the early 90s and when lawsuits happened against uh, any production on those lands, the revenues for the counties fell dramatically and we're talking millions of dollars of revenue that didn't come to the counties. Of course when the federal lawsuits started happening, it affected our rural communities tremendously because the mills shut down, the jobs were lost. This was the only income for the family. And after the Northwest Forest Plan was written, uh, a couple, two or three years after it was written, I did a study on the rural communities to, to talk to people to find out what actually had happened in their community. And I found that the the man of the family who had been logging or working in a mill had to go elsewhere for work, which meant it broke up the families. They became long, long haul truck drivers. They had to go to Alaska to work. Juvenile delinquency rose. Uh, spousal abuse rose in the families, alcohol and drugs. And the families became a lot less functional because of the lack of work and the lack of income, and, uh, and the housing deteriorated dramatically. So we know the effects of a, a robust industry in our rural communities, and we know what happens when we lose it. It also affects the culture of the rural communities because we're talking about generations of people who love the woods, would not do anything to destroy the woods, they live there because they love it, and they love working in the woods. And so these people have been, many of them, displaced, very disenchanted with the federal government and the way that, that the rural communities have been affected. It seems like our, some of our forests are being managed in courtrooms, not by directly by foresters. We need to allow forest managers that have the competent skills and abilities to manage our forests and not necessarily let litigation start to, to manage our forests. I think it's important to have forests have more of a mosaic approach where we have things like our national park system where we have untouched reserves of beautiful large trees. I'm going to have my grandchildren go to Crater Lake someday and be able to see the same trees that I saw when I was a young person. I think those social values are really important. I also think that some of the economic values are very important where we have timber dollars come in to support our local communities and have a natural resource that is in perpetuity growing continuously. That's really rare, I think, for a lot of other places in America that perhaps do coal or steel, something that isn't going to continue to grow. We have a really unique resource that we can manage in perpetuity and maximize those values. Old growth is always in the news and it seems to be one of the things that I, we are always constantly striving for on our public lands. Old growth currently doesn't really have a definition of a diameter or an age class, but more of a, a biodiversity standpoint. We can really easily manage for old growth and actually even in, in grow more old growth if we're able to do good stand management of our current stands. That, that being said, we can do timber management in old growth, we can grow wildlife in old growth, we can do all these different things through good stand management practices. We can even do certain harvests in old growth and really promote those large trees being able to be grown. 
uh, and those can be for wildlife, for aesthetic values, for uh, different social values, and really the whole different uh, array of things that people expect from our forests. Things like the Biscuit Fire really present a unique management for foresters in the local area. We know that foresters are going to eventually come back through the natural approach. However, the natural approach might take a lot longer period of time than if we went in and were able to do good stand management and get trees growing back immediately again. The land would come back to brush and it would come back and really be not conducive for tree growing for perhaps up to 100 years. And it would really be kind of difficult to control fires in there again and has a lot of potential for reburn. Uh, being able to do good stand management, uh, clearing some of those trees, uh, extracting the values that we have out there now, and then being able to put that land back into production for all the water needs, the wildlife needs, as well as wood product needs, might be a really good way to address things. Uh, some of the recent controversy has been uh, that should we go in and extract some of the timber values and, and get things out of there now and get back into planting, or should we let it go back to natural? On a scale of 500,000 acres, which is roughly the size of the Biscuit Fire, I think we can have different management approaches and really experience all the different pieces that go in there. We, have, we know that we're going to have costs of fighting fires, we know we're going to have costs of fire management, and perhaps some of the, uh, the extractions that we could have from there could help pay some of those bills, as well as put local people to work, and also get that land back producing those values that the that society really needs. Some of those values might be timber for our homes that we use. It might be those wildlife values that we like to have and the aesthetic values. It also might be the water flowing into the rivers or just the creeks and streams that we have. But using all the tools in the toolbox, that clear cutting, the partial cutting, the planting, all those different things really allows for good forest management and allows us to, to meet the objectives of the landowners, whether it be public or private ownership. I hope that we can get back to a holistic sense of our forests and our forest values. People need to realize that our forests are here, they're growing, and we need to be able to balance the social, environmental, and economic approach so we can maximize the values that come from our forests. What you're witnessing behind me, <coughs> pardon me, is the destruction of the last remaining sawmill in Jackson County, Oregon. It did not need to happen. We have millions and millions of board feet growing every year in the Rogue River National Forest or the old Rogue River National Forest, Siskiyou National Forest and BLM lands. It's estimated that there are over 400 million feet a year of annual growth in the old Rogue River National Forest which is basically eastern and northern Jackson County federally owned U.S. Forest Service managed timber. The BLM in southern Oregon grows approximately 175 200 million feet a year, and the Siskiyou National Forest in Josephine County it was estimated prior to the Biscuit Fire grew about 800 to 850 million board feet of timber annually. What you see behind me is the result of mills not being able to have access to federal timber for whatever reason, mostly in, in the last 20 years to environmental lawsuits. If we had been able to salvage even the dead from the timberlands, in Jackson County, this mill would probably still be going today. That would be enough volume to keep them operating annually. 25 years ago, we had 20, 25 operating sawmills or plywood mills in Southern Oregon, Josephine and Jackson, Jackson County. Today, we have one operating sawmill and I think three plywood mills that are actually feeding logs. That's it, that's the total production of, of timber. People just don't understand what wealth creation is, what it entails. You've either got to grow something, raise something, produce something, use a natural resource of some sort somewhere, whether it be iron ore out of the ground to make steel, timber to make wood and wood byproducts, for instance, plywood or OSB. You've got to grow something like wheat or raise cattle. You've got to remanufacture something. That's how wealth is created in this world. We are losing our capacity at this juncture in this country to create wealth. It's a sad, sad tale. It does not need to happen. It did not need to happen. And it's happening before your very eyes right now. What do we do about it? Well, if we do nothing, we're going to lose our natural resources. For instance, the timber we have growing in the, the hills and mountains all around us. Um, 
that right now are growing at such an astronomical rate that our fire danger has never been greater. We saw the Biscuit Fire of 2002. It burned about almost 760 square miles of timberland. It killed between four and five billion board feet of timber, most of it old growth timber. Almost none of it was utilized. It's laying or it's standing in the forests over there and it's deteriorating as we speak. At the time of the fire, it's estimated that approximately 15 million tons of carbon was released into the atmosphere by the fire alone. Over the next 50 years, as that timber further deteriorates, that untouched, unsalvaged timber deteriorates, that amount will be tripled. So we're looking at an, a net carbon release of about 60 million tons of carbon in the atmosphere. I know there's a lot of concern about climate change and global warming. This is one of the major sources of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And yet, we can't touch it, or the vast majority of it is not touched due to environmental lawsuits or constraints. In 1973, Congress passed the Endangered Species Act. Many of us think that it has been misused or not used in its original intent to thwart what we think is viable industry. In 2007, there was a court case, ONRC v. Allen, in effect, it stopped all logging in southern Oregon forests that were managed by the BLM, which are formerly known as the ONC lands. Zero was harvested from those lands in 2007. In 2008, had it not been for a blowdown of timber up in the Butte Falls area, it would again have been most likely zero harvested from BLM lands. Right now, for 09, it looks like almost all lands that are not going to be salvaged lands will be off limits to harvesting in southern Oregon on BLM lands.